true that every day that we live, it is a gift from God, and we should be very grateful uh, for that. I wanted to, um, first of all, when we sing that song, Count Your Blessings, name them one by one, a number of years ago as I was directed to a particular passage in Scripture, it has nothing to do with the actual message this morning. It just came to my mind a moment ago, so I looked it up. The Bible says in Psalm 68, 19, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. And uh, I'm very familiar with the word load or loads. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, we buy cattle and, and uh, oftentimes I'll say we bought a pot load. And if you're a rancher, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a load of pot. I'm talking about a pot load. And the Bible says that God daily loads us with benefits. So when I hear that song, Count Your Blessings, instead of one by one, I have a tendency to say, Count Your Blessings, name them ton by ton, because God gives us so many blessings that I don't believe you can measure them in ones or even in pounds. They need to be measured by the ton. God has so richly blessed us, and I hope that you are thankful for that. This is Thanksgiving week, and I always look forward to Thanksgiving week. We all get together as families. We can rejoice in the Lord for all that He has done and truly be thankful. I want you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. And I'm going to read several verses to you there. And uh, I'm going to make this statement several times in the message this morning so you can just get ready for it. We should be thankful people. We should be a grateful people for many, many reasons. But there is a primary reason that all of us should be thankful or grateful, and it is simply this, because God has instructed us to be thankful. Now, I want to say that again, and if you're getting what I'm saying, I want you to say amen. The primary reason that we should be thankful is simply because God has commanded it. Okay, that was a little weak. I'm going to do that again. I'm going to get all of you. <laughs> Don't be ungrateful. Don't be unthankful. Don't live with a spirit of ingratitude. Now, I'm not going to let you sit down until you all say amen, okay? <laughs> How many of you understand that we have a command from God, and it is a perpetual command that will never change? He says, be ye thankful. Amen. Gotcha. Amen. Amen. Now, let me read to you, and I believe that God will absolutely deal with some of our hearts today. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse number 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ setteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For you're dead. We're talking about once we have been born again into the kingdom of God. And your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Now, the next few verses are simple instruction for those of us who are risen with Christ. In other words, if you're saved today, then God, through his word, gives us some very simple daily instruction on the things that we should do, the things that we should refrain from doing, uh, so that we might be able to walk in lockstep with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible, in verse 15, says this, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Now, drop down to, well, I, let me just read the next few verses. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. If I could just entitle the next few messages that I'm going to preach here on Sunday mornings, the title would be simply, Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Lord. And it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit of God will deal with every one of you. 
and that you will purpose to be obedient to God and in your daily lives demonstrate a spirit of gratefulness. If you're saved today, and you've heard me say this many times, let me just reiterate, if you're a child of God today, if you never received another blessing past the moment that he saved your soul, he is worthy of your thanks. He is worthy of our praise, our adoration. He is worthy of us giving him thanks. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for loving us, for your grace, for your mercy. Father, with words, we can never, ever thank you enough. But God, it's not our words, it's not lip service that you're interested in. Father, you're interested in how we live and how we demonstrate, Lord, our relationship with you out in this world. And so God, help us to be thankful and to remember, Lord, that we can count our blessings load by load and ton by ton because you daily loadeth us with benefits. Lord, save somebody today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You can be seated. I'll shorten the message a little this morning by taking a few moments of a personal illustration. I have found it true, and I know that our Bible teachers here at the church, we communicate a lot. And I know that you have found this true as well. That when you begin to study on a particular subject, especially like your Sunday school lessons and getting ready to present the Word of God, and it's the same with Pastor Clay and I, <clears throat> as we begin to study a subject and, and prepare to preach, it's like that God gives us opportunity to practice what we are preaching. Now, how many of you have ever heard that term, practice what you preach? And we should all do that, be willing uh, to do that. And God always affords those opportunities. So <clears throat> before I preach this morning, I just want to give a, a word of personal confession, if I may. We had a wonderful memorial service yesterday for Miss Rejoice. And praise God, she's in heaven today. And we're, we're so grateful for them, that family. After the service was over, the family wanted some of our ladies to come over and to uh, gather Miss Rejoice's belongings, and they did. And so they brought those belongings, and they, are, uh, they brought them into our fellowship hall because the family wanted to be a blessing to our church. Now, we understand that to some people, what may be a blessing may be a burden to someone else, but that's not the point. The point is that family wanted to be a blessing to our church, and so our ladies went over and they got these belongings. They're in the fellowship hall. And people can go get them. They wanted to be a blessing to us, but I left after the funeral, came back a few hours later, and when I came into the fellowship hall, my attitude went through the roof. Now, how many of y'all know that confession is good for the soul, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> and we need to practice what we preach. I'm trying to be transparent as I always am. And I came into Fellowship Hall, and it looked like a garage sale. And I don't like for the church to look like a garage sale. I want the church to look like a church. I think we should be reverent at the church by the way we take care of the facilities and such as that. How many of you are old-fashioned enough to believe that way? I mean, guys, this is the sanctuary of God. This is the house of God. And so my attitude when I walked in was, what's all this stuff? And the ladies heard. I, I was speaking to the ladies. I'm glad my wife was there <clears throat> to hold me accountable here. <clears throat> and... Uh, and they began to explain to me what I just explained to you. And so I went on my way with a, a spirit of ungratefulness. Because what somebody wanted to bless us with, I was rejecting because I had a spirit of ingratitude. Now, are y'all following me? I want to be able to practice what I preach. Many years ago, we just put carpet in the fellowship hall. Well, we were so proud of our new carpet. 
And on a Wednesday evening, I walked into the fellowship hall and there was just mud tracks all over the fellowship hall. And I got everybody's attention and I said, who tracked the mud in the fellowship hall? And there was this little boy. He was about this big. He lived in a house back here about a quarter of a mile. And he looked right at me and he said, preacher, I did that. He said, I, I, walk, I had to walk to church tonight, and it's muddy down our driveway. Such a spirit of ungratefulness. Such a spirit of maybe we deserve better. And I say these things to you on a very personal level. Because if I struggle with things like that, maybe you do too. Maybe, if you don't, praise God. But maybe you struggle with things like that too. When God has so richly blessed us, and I reached down and hugged that little fella, and I just hoped he kicked mud all over my britches to remind me that I ought to be grateful for a little boy that loved the Lord enough that he had walked to church on a cold, rainy night instead of being worried about a piece of carpet that we could vacuum and clean. And by the way, we buy that stuff to walk on. And so I want to preach this message this morning, not just to you, but looking right in a mirror and realizing that I think one of the greatest sins that we commit against our Heavenly Father is a spirit of ungratefulness, a spirit of thanklessness to a God who loved us so much that He sent His own Son to stretch out His arms and die on a cruel cross so that you and I could enjoy a life here, literally an abundant life here. All the daily blessings that he loads us with. He loved us that much. And could we not just be grateful to him? Just thank God for all he's done for us. Rather than look around and pick out this and pick out that and I don't like this and I don't like that. You know, it would be better for us to just wake up every morning and say, I really like God. I love my Heavenly Father and be grateful. So I want to encourage you this morning to be thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be real personal in these next few messages and I hope that it, that it touches you in a personal way because once again I believe that one of the greatest sins that Christians commit is a spirit of ingratitude, a spirit of entitlement rather than gratefulness. So the question is this morning, are you thankful? Because the Bible says in a command to us, be ye thankful. Be ye thankful. Did you know that as we get into the Word of God, I'm not going to ask you to turn to all these places this morning for the sake of time. Did you know that we often criticize Job's wife because of something that she said to Job? She said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Why don't you just curse God and die? Now, some of you are looking at me kind of strange because I've not given you the context of that. Most of you know the context of that. Job and his family had been blessed. They had prospered for years according to the Word of God. They had about anything that a person could desire to have. They, their, their, their possessions were innumerable, and they had a great family, family togetherness. But in just a short span of time, those things were all gone. The family had died except for Job's wife. All their possessions had been, had been taken away. I might add, not because God was not able to keep them, but because God allowed that to happen. And I, this is a great place for me to tell you this, that whatever happens in your life, if you're a child of God, it is because God either ordained it or he allowed it. Yeah. Nothing happens to a child of God that he does not orchestrate or allow. But Job and his wife had everything, and now in her eyes, they had nothing. Job's physical health was in shambles. He had balls from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He was the most miserable man at that time in his life. 
and his wife comes to him and not remembering all the things that God had done for them in the past, not being grateful for what they had had, she said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Now, none of us would ever be that dramatic. None of us would ever say that directly to God. But many times it's true that we fail to look back and, and thank God for the things that he has already done for us because we have a spirit of entitlement for things that we want tomorrow or in the future. And so we fail to be grateful for what he has done because we have a spirit of an entitlement for what we think he ought to do. And it's a great sin. I'm grateful the way Job answered because Job simply said to his wife, he said, will we receive the great blessings of God? I paraphrase this. Do we receive the good from God? And then when things are not going so good, do we then curse God? And of course the answer was no. We need to thank God for the past. We need to thank him for today. We need to thank him for tomorrow. Knowing that he is in absolute control. You see, we can find in Scripture many reasons to demonstrate a spirit of thanksgiving or gratefulness. Did you know that families break up just on a daily basis? And we could get deep into the theological reasons as to why families break up, but you know generally it's because of a spirit of ingratitude. It's a spirit of ingratitude. First of all, toward God. We deal with lots of marital issues. That's just the nature of the ministry. Do you know that, that many, many marriages that are on the brink of, of disaster, could, those issues could be remedied. And I'm going to say something to you men. Sir, if you would just love your wife like, like, like Christ loved the church. Now listen to me. Now some of you men are going, well, what about my wife? I'll get to her next. If God's men would simply love their wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it and be grateful for the wife that God has given to you, most of your marital problems would end. Now, you men, you ladies like that, now let me say this to you ladies. If you would love your husband and Submit to your husband as is given in the word of God. This is not Baptist doctrine. It's not my doctrine. It's the word of God. And be grateful for the husband that God has given to you. I know it's tough, Shelly, but I mean just go ahead and just be grateful <laughs> for the man that God has given to you. Most marital problems would dissolve quickly. But we have a spirit of ingratitude. We don't wake up of a morning, and you men, I want to encourage you, but maybe don't wait till in the morning. When you get home, why don't you just tell your wife that you're grateful for her? And ladies, you might do the same. A spirit of ingratitude destroys homes. It splits churches. It, it affects nations. I believe that one of the greatest sins that we commit is a spirit of ingratitude toward our Heavenly Father. Did you know that the Bible commands us to be grateful. And I, I know, I know because I talk to many of you every week, and I know that some of you think that almost every message I preach or even Pastor Clay preaches ultimately ends up with, let's be obedient to the Word of God. And can I tell you, that's exactly where every message ought to go is directly to being obedient to the Word of God. If He's my Heavenly Father and I'm His child, and He gave everything so that I might be saved, then I'll say this, uh, the least that I can do is to demonstrate a spirit of gratefulness for what He's done for me. Did you know that it is hypocrisy? I was sharing this with one of my men just this morning. It is absolute hypocrisy, and I'll just... I could put it husbands to wives, wives to husbands, children to parents. I've already hit the husbands and the wives. Let me just say this to the children. It is hypocrisy, you young people, for you to tell your parent that you are grateful for them 
and then ignore what they ask you to do. It's a spirit of total hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy for me to tell God, God, I'm so grateful for all that you've done. God, I'm so thankful for you. And then open his word, look at his word, and ignore his word. That's a spirit of hypocrisy. That's not gratefulness. Gratefulness, thankfulness will manifest itself in a humble spirit of obedience. Okay? You want to write that down. Thankfulness will manifest itself in a spirit of obedience to whoever is in our authority. God, family, mom, dad, church. So it's easy for us, if, we'll, if we want to know the truth, it's easy for us to open the Word of God and, and ask the question, am I thankful? And then answer it honestly, because the Word of God will shed light on that. Now, it's very quiet in here this morning. Now, I know that the five Turner kids are not here today. <laughs> Pastor Clay's preaching at Pryor this morning. And uh, the five Roggen Camp kids are not here this morning, so I know that will silence some. But some of you guys are very quiet, and I'm not sure that I can figure it out. Okay? How many of you know that if you've not been grateful, that you could ask God's forgiveness, and then you can go ahead and smile again? You don't have to look at me like you ate something sour. Okay? But we do have to ask God's forgiveness for that. Now, so the Bible tells us that we're to be thankful... And then the Bible is very clear that not doing so is sin and a spirit of hypocrisy. There are several words that I want to use <clears throat> over the next few weeks that are very similar. They are tied together in principle. The word rejoice, the word praise, the word gratefulness, the word thanksgiving, those are all tied together in principle. When used in their proper sense, if you will, they are all referencing a spirit of gratefulness or thanksgiving. Now, that spirit of thanksgiving will manifest itself in joy, rejoicing, praise, gratefulness, and ultimately obedience. Now, I mentioned earlier that there are several reasons why we should be grateful. <clears throat> Right, I've got to do this. Y'all are dead quiet this morning. I want, would all you husbands, if you're sitting close to your wife, would you look at your wife right now and tell her I'm grateful for you? I'm watching. Go ahead. Come on now. Do it. Okay, did any of you wives, did your husband bail out just then? If you do, just let me know afterwards. I'll deal with that. Okay. Now, to be perfectly fair, would you wives look at your husband and say, I'm grateful to God for you? Well, I want to see you do it again. Thank you. Okay. All right. She had a mask on. I didn't know whether she did or not because I can't read her lips. Okay. So did y'all get that done? Okay. Now, now listen. So I, 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 want you, I want you to just listen and don't be dead quiet. Okay. Just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. I know this is a tough message. I mean, it burdened my heart to preach it. I'm serious because of my own life. But it's essential that we get this straight. Did you know that God does so much for us? God does so, does so much, and yet we are so inundated with things that are not related at all to spiritual things so that when God does something even miraculous in our lives, oftentimes we fail to give him thanks for it. We act like we deserve that. We often get angry or frustrated with God when things do not turn out the way that we wanted them to turn out rather than be thankful to God for all he's done. And so God commanded us to be thankful. You can read that and obviously you can get a CD of the message but in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Bible says, In everything give thanks. Psalms 33.1, Rejoice in the Lord, all ye righteous. Psalms 100, verse 4, Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Psalms 107, verse 8, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. Psalms 136, 
O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. We are commanded by God to be grateful, to be thankful. Let me give you another reason other than the fact that God said so. We need to be thankful, we need to rejoice because of God's ultimate power and his trustworthiness. The Bible says in Psalms 28, 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusteth in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. God is an all-powerful God. He is a God that the Bible says even the winds and the waves obey his will. He is a God that is so powerful. The Bible says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. God has the power to give you a new life. And if you're saved today, God has given you a new life. He is the one who has the power to do so. We ought to thank him for his great power and trustworthiness. I read in Luke 17 just this morning, the story of the ten lepers. If you'll read that in your quiet time, I believe it will help you. Luke 17. The Bible says there were ten lepers that came to Christ. Many of you are very familiar with the story. The ten lepers came to Christ and they even called him Master and Lord. And they, coming into his presence, realizing that, that, that they had leprosy, an incurable literally speaking, an incurable disease that usually ended in the most horrific manner that one could even imagine. The greatest of which was not just physical pain and suffering, but the fact that when somebody had leprosy, when they met somebody coming down the road, that was before they were detained to a leper colony, that when they met somebody coming, they were required by law to cry out, unclean, unclean, and they had no contact with anyone because they were lepers. Oh, the heartbreak of being separated from your friends and your family, and a man with leprosy could no longer hug his wife or hold his children on his lap. That was all out because he had leprosy. He was unclean. And the lepers came to Christ with a need. And Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priest. And you can read that in your quiet time and study it and you'll understand it. And the Bible says that as they went their way, in other words, they didn't have to get all the way to where God told them to go. As they went on their way, the Bible says they were cleansed. Which proves that the healing came from God, not the priest. And so they were healed. The Bible says that one of those men, I want you to get this. One out of ten returned to Jesus. And the Bible says that he had a, such a spirit of gratefulness, gratitude for God, that he fell on his face before God and praised God and thanked God. Read that in Luke 17. And I believe that, that as he looked at himself and, and the leprosy was gone, and he looked up to the Lord Jesus Christ, he could do nothing more than just praise God and thank God for his cleansing. But it was deeper than that. Jesus looked there and he said to that man, you see, Jesus' math is perfect. It's perfect. He looked down and he said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing and illustrating here, and it's like that Jesus looked down and won. And he said, were there not ten? Were there not ten lepers so desperate for healing that they even call me master? And only one, only one returned to say thank you. Jesus, in that, in that story in Luke 17, Jesus said to that one man, he said, Go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. That man not only received physical healing, but he received divine healing. I believe that at that point in time, because of his faith in God, that God saved his wretched soul. 
The other ten received their physical healing. They probably went back home to their wives and their children and their businesses and their otherwise busy schedule. But without Christ. Because they didn't return to give him thanks. They were not the recipients of that proclamation. Go thy way. Now you're really made whole. The question I would ask again this morning is are we thankful? Are we thankful? We need to thank God for his salvation. I believe that most of us have done that. We sing a song that says Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe sin it left a crimson stain. But he washed it white as snow. Am I grateful? Do I thank God for that on a daily basis? We need to be thankful to God because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The, the answer to this question should be yes, but how many of you are grateful to God that when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came and took up residence in your body? Amen. We have the personal ministry of the Holy Spirit of God living in us. You might say, well, what is that ministry? If you're a child of God, when you do something that is against the Word of God, contrary to the Word of God, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And you feel bad. Now, some of you go, well, I don't like that. Well, that's too bad. If you're saved, you got that. And so the Holy Spirit convicts us, never fails. Now listen to me, you've got to get this. Because in a congregation like this, there's some folks that say they're saved, they're not saved. You might say, how do you know that? That's a pretty broad statement. Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, the, the latter part of the Sermon on the Mount, he says many there will be that say, many. Well, if you just define many and you take a crowd of this size, I would at least say that there may be a handful that professes Christ, but there's nothing to prove that. Many will say in that day, we ought to thank God for the ministry of the Holy Spirit because when we do something that we should not do or if we fail to do something that we should do, like give thanks, we feel that conviction. Okay? And then we have a decision to make. Now listen to me. If you guys want to hear a really good, just a make me feel good message, y'all are going to have to go somewhere else. <laughs> guys, listen, I'm serious. We are in the latter days. And people better get serious about God. You may be playing games, but God is not playing games. No games. So the Holy Spirit of God convicts you. And then you have a decision to make. Will I submit to the Holy Spirit of God? Well, what does that mean? That means the Word of God says that He will reprove the world of sin. And so, as the Holy Spirit convicts us, He doesn't just leave us with a conviction. He literally directs us to the truth, to the Word of God. So, our decision is this. Do I submit to the Holy Spirit? Or do I do my own thing? And you cannot say, God, I'm so grateful for the Holy Spirit that lives in me. And then ignore the direction that the Holy Spirit is trying to lead you. You can't have it both ways. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is so powerful. Did you know that if you say you're saved today and you're living in disobedience to God, and you are not convicted. Now, I'm going to throw out a big old blanket. If you, if you are living contrary to the Word of God, against the Word of God, and you do not feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you are not saved. Can't be. Because He lives in there. You understand? He's not renting space and shows up occasionally, he lives in your body. That's where he abides. 
and he will share his glory with nobody. I've had people say, well, preacher, I'm not convicted about that. If the Bible says this is right and this is wrong, and you don't, you're not convicted about that? People say, well, I'm just not that mature yet. Listen, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, it is obviously a sanctifying, growing thing that will last until the day I die. But the conviction of the Holy Spirit is immediate the moment I get saved. The moment I get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in me. And if I, if I cannot have a grateful spirit because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to the point that I disobey, I ignore, then I would encourage you here in a few moments that you might give your life to Jesus. Get it settled. Give your life to Christ. Get it over with. Get that settled. And God will give you a spirit of gratefulness. He'll give you a spirit of thankfulness. Not only for your salvation, but for those that God has used in your life. We need to thank God, not just for our personal blessings, but our spiritual blessings. What do you mean our spiritual blessings, Pastor? In your quiet time reading Ephesians chapter 1, as a matter of fact, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to give you something really quick. People say, well, I don't know what I need to be grateful for. Well, let me just show you this. Because of your spiritual blessings. The Bible says in verse 3 in chapter 1, Blessed be the God of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he hath chosen us. Chosen us. Now, I don't know whether to run or keep preaching. <laughs> Did you know that God in his absolute perfect wisdom and knowledge and compassion chose you he chose you he chose this poor miserable wretched sinner he chose me when I was in school there was a little game that I hated I mean I hated it it was where we got ready to play a particular game, and we chose up sides. I hated it. You might say, well, that's because you used a little wimp, and you couldn't, and so you was always the last guy to get chosen. Well, actually, I was the last guy to get chosen. But I would watch as they always picked the big guy to, to be the captain, and they would choose up. And they'd get down to where there was just a, two or three little ones left. Some of you guys used to be coaches. You know what I'm talking about. And those little fellows, listen, they wanted to play so bad. And they would have put all that they had into it. But the big guys, I've heard them say, you can, have them, you can have the last three. I don't want them. Right? Aren't you glad that when God chose you, He didn't choose me on my ability to speak. He didn't choose me because I had the business on Main Street or because I had the... No, God chose you on the basis of His grace and His mercy and His love for mankind. God chose you. Matter of fact... He chose the little guy first. He says in 1 Corinthians, he says God will take the simple things and confound the wise. I mean, God will take the simple things and confound the wise. Guys, you're not going to believe this, but do you know when I was in school, the, the subject that, that I dodged, the subject that I pled with my teacher just to let me do anything uh, to make the grade, guess what it was? Speech. I'm serious. I hated speech. I could not stand up in front of anybody. I would go to my teacher and say, listen, I'll write reports. I'll do anything. Don't make me stand up in front of people. 
And so we know that God doesn't choose us based, he chooses us based on what he can make us, not what we are. Aren't you glad? We come to God just as we are, but we don't leave the way that we came. Are you grateful for that? I mean, have you thanked God? When you get home, look in the mirror. Now look past all the makeup and all that kind of stuff. Look past that and realize who I am and thank God that he chose me. He chose me to spend eternity with him in heaven. We've had a lot of people stay in our home for long periods of time. Chet and Darlene, I love you, but y'all stayed long enough. <laughs> I see Blake sitting back here. Blake, you, listen, Brody was a baby when they came to stay with us. He was shaving when they left. <laughs> and I'm grateful for all that, but did you know that God chose me to spend eternity with him? Say amen. amen. He chose you to spend eternity for him in a house that he built. Praise God. Thank God. Man, I came home the other day. The wind had been blowing. There was two shingles laying out in the yard. I opened the back door. And there was a whole bunch of ants crawling up the wall. I had to call the guy that takes care of that. And God chose me to live with him in eternity in a place, Brother Wade, that won't need no upkeep. Aren't you grateful for that? You ought to be grateful. Now listen. He said he chose us. I'll just stand right here. The Bible says that he adopted us too. In other words, he didn't just choose me to come and spend a little time with him. He took me as his own. We've got children in our church that adopted. We've got parents that love children enough to adopt them. Praise God. But did you know that God adopted you? He adopted you. Listen, he didn't just invite you over and you are, in a, you are a visitor. He invited you over and he did the adoption to where you are his own. Praise God for that. We ought to thank God for his spiritual blessings. The Bible says that he has accepted us. He has redeemed us through his blood. He has forgiven us. We're now heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I talked to a family the other day and they, they had become heirs of a, of, a, of a fortune. Literally heirs of a fortune. And they were expressing gratefulness and gratitude. But guys, can I tell you that what God has done for us can't be measured in dollars. It cannot be measured in material things. We ought to thank God for our spiritual blessings that he has so graciously poured out on our lives. We are to be thankful. We should be thankful because God orchestrates everything. He says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. We need to thank God for the future promises that we have. The Bible says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 12, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward. Where? In heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. I've been to three funerals this week. And I says, as I said in a funeral service, whether I'm doing the service or not, i got to tell you, I... I just get so homesick for heaven. You might say, well, you've never been there before. How are you? How, why? Listen, I've never been there before, but I'm going there someday. And that will be my final home. And I'm thankful to God that he has blessed me with future blessings. We need to thank God for the privilege we have to pray. We need to thank God for his word. I, I don't know. Most of you know that I make a big deal about the word of God. You ought to be thankful. As a matter of fact, maybe before you leave our sanctuary today, you ought to thank God that you've got a Bible. I read in a magazine the other day, The Voice of the Martyrs, where there was a particular place that some Bibles had been smuggled in and that they were having what you would call underground church. 
But the leaders of that area where this was, I believe it was in Sudan, I'm not sure. The leaders found out that this particular man was a pastor of an underground church. In the Bible, the, the story I read, and it gave all the information I trusted, it said that these, these actually would be what we would call like martial law. They came in, they took all the Bibles, they burned all the Bibles, and they tortured and killed the pastor. You might say, not, you're talking about something happened years ago. No, I'm talking about something that's happening right now. You ought to go home today and thank God that you have a Bible where you can open that Bible and God can speak directly to you. You ought to thank God for that. We need to be grateful to God and I'm going to get to the end of this. We need to thank God for His Word in as much as the Bible says His Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I got called out in the night the other night and as I was heading through the house to get to where I was needing to go, I opened the little door where we keep stuff and grabbed a flashlight, got out in the vehicle, got to where I was going. The battery was dead. Aren't you grateful? Psalms 19, 119 verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, and his battery never runs down. His battery never runs down. Because it's a perpetual power. It's the power of God. He said, He is the light of the world. Never have to worry about that battery running down. And so we should be thankful for the word because it is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You young people ought to thank God for his word because the Bible says in Psalms 119 in verse number 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way but by taking heed thereto unto the word of God? You want your way to be clean? Take heed to the word of God. That's what he said. We have young people that seem to be struggling, struggling about this, struggling about that. Most of that is a satanic distraction. You want to know? His word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. If you're groping around in darkness, it's because you are not accessing the light. That's rather simple. Satan makes life difficult. Psalms 119.11 says, The entrance of thy word giveth light. I'm sorry, that's Psalms 119, verse 130. And then the Bible says also in Psalms 119, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Are you grateful? Are you thankful for the word of God? It's your shield. It's your buckler. It's your light. And then we need to be thankful. We need to rejoice and be thankful because of the fellowship we have in the body. Now, I know this, this one gets a little tough. What do you mean the fellowship we have in the body? Uh, I, th here's the question. Are you saved and are you a part of the body of Christ? Amen. Okay. You ought to be grateful for that. But with that comes a responsibility. With every privilege, the privilege of being part of a body there comes a responsibility, and that is, then be a part of the body. I mean, be what you claim that you are, which is a part of the body. Do whatever it is that God has called you to do in the body. The Bible says that we are a body fitly joined together. Fitly joined together. And so... If we, are, if we believe that and we have a grateful attitude about that, God, I'm so grateful for this body. I hear this every week, many times every day. I'm so grateful to be a part of a church. I'm so grateful for my church family. Listen, is that just talk or do you mean that? Is it just talk or do you mean it? Well, 
Let me tell you a couple ways you can tell. Because when somebody in the body that's supposed to be fitly joined together with you, okay? In other words, that means that you abide side by side. We serve the same God. We're here for the same reason. We are fitly joined together. One of the ways you can tell if you're a part of that is how you respond when someone in the body holds you accountable. Amen. Yeah, that's how you tell. That's how you tell. It's hypocrisy for us to say, I'm so grateful that I'm a part of the body of Christ. And then you stick out like a sore thumb because you don't want to fulfill your place where you should be fitly in place. Okay? Now some of y'all are going, and some of y'all are going, some of y'all look pitiful. Some of y'all are saying, if I get out of here, I'll have to really pray about coming back next week. <laughs> well, if you pray about it, you'll be back next week. But if you just do your thing, you probably won't. Are you thankful? This coming Thursday is Thanksgiving. You know, the other day, somebody told Miss Deb, said, you better go to the store and get your turkey because they're running out. Well, I could care less myself. I'd just soon have a good old piece of beef. Are, are, you, are you grateful for what you're going to have to eat Thursday? Yes. Guys, I'm, I'm I told you I was going to get down to where we live here. Are you grateful that when the preacher quits preaching today, after a while, <laughs> that you are not going to go home to an empty refrigerator or an empty cupboard? Are you grateful for that? ran into a guy the other day. We had opportunity to help him. All of his worldly possessions was a little folded up aluminum chair that was almost completely dilapidated and gone. And a little bag about the size of... No, it wasn't big as that purse. But I mean, <laughs> uh, a little bag in all his worldly possessions. Are y'all following me? I'm, I'm not talking about a story I read in the news... Are you thankful that when you get out of here today, you're going to be able to go eat a bite? You say, well, preacher, I mean, the Bible says that God will provide all of our needs. I mean, can't we just expect it? Now, let me say this. If God promises, we can expect it. It's the attitude that I'm talking about. Is it an attitude that says I can expect it because I deserve it? Or is it an attitude that said I can expect to have food because God has promised Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I'll take care of your basic needs. It's, the, it's our attitude of thankfulness. Christmas, Thanksgiving, present many, many opportunities for us to grow. We have a tradition with our family. After we have our meal, we all sit around in a big circle, however big that may be. And we start with one person and we go around the circle and everybody says what they're thankful for. And when you get to the little kids, sometimes some of the things they say might be a little bit funny or such as that. But do you understand it's, it's, the, it's the teaching. You need to be thankful. And yet, it comes Christmas time. The kids open their gifts, and y'all can almost see the picture, can't you? Tear through this one, push it aside. Tear through this one, push it aside. Tear through this one, push it aside. And unless the parents say, now listen, you need to thank Grandpa for that, or you need to thank Grandma for that, or, or, or you need to thank Grandma Sue for that. The kids just tear through it, tear through it like, man, I, I, I'm going to pile my stuff up over here. And many times, 
Now, I'm being so practical, y'all listen. Many times, your children get to the end of their opening and they'll say, well, I wanted a, I, I mean, I wanted a, I wanted a, a Lego set with a thousand pieces. Are y'all following me? That's what happens. I could give y'all a little bit of parental instruction since I've got 10 grandkids. I believe if that were to happen, I believe that I would very quietly and deliberately go over to that person's pile, take all of that person's pile and put them away and say, you can have those when you decide to be grateful. It's a great teaching time. Are you grateful for the gift, the eternal gifts that God has put not under your tree, but in your hands? I said I was going to be practical, so let me touch one more thing and then I'll close. Miss Kristen, if you'll make your way to the piano, please. How many of you are old enough to remember That'd be my age or older, probably. That, and I'll just use an illustration here, that when you got your driver's license, that you were so grateful if Dad would let you drive the old farm truck to town maybe once a month. Y'all remember that? I mean, when we were growing up, we had one, one pickup, single cab by my dad, and we all shared it. Not by choice. We didn't have any choice. But can I tell you, we, I, I, I was grateful that I had a ride. I heard a story one time about a, a young boy. He let his hair grow out real long. His dad said, you need to get a haircut. He goes, he didn't want to get a haircut. His dad told him later, he said, um, I'm not going to let you drive until you get a haircut. The kid said, Jesus had long hair. His dad said, yeah, and he walked everywhere he went. (laughs) You can keep your hair cut and ride my donkey. (laughs) That kind of teaches you to be grateful, wouldn't it? Now we're going to get down to the rubber here. I love to speak to our young people. We have got a wonderful, wonderful church full of young people. I mean, now there's some exception, but God's still working on them. Last Sunday, the kids got up here to sing. I didn't, I can't count them, but there must have been 30 kids standing up here. Little old bitty things all the way up. I'm so grateful for our young people, our young adults. But there is a war on. There is a war. This world offers so much much entertainment and so many distractions. And Christians are the most vulnerable targets of any people group in the whole world. Christians are the most vulnerable targets because we'll buy into almost anything if it satisfies my flesh. And yet the Bible says that we're not in a battle with flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. Many Christians today have more and sweeter fellowship with the lost and the worldly than they do with the church. You are more comfortable out with your peers doing things that you know violate the word of God, dishonor your parents, dishonor your church, and you're more comfortable in that setting than you are in fellowship in the body. There's a problem with that. You young people, are you grateful 
that God has given you parents that love you and have literally laid their life down to give you life. Are you grateful to your mom and dad that they have sacrificed immensely to provide for you? Oh yeah, preacher, I'm grateful for my mom and dad. Do you do what they say? Because it's hypocrisy. If you say that you're grateful, I would like to haul some of you, not just you young people, but especially, I'd like to haul you around with me for about a month, take you to some of the places that I go visit. I'm talking about, yes, today, yes, last week. where children sleep on the floor with a blanket because they don't have a bed. Y'all follow me? I'm not talking about in a foreign country. I'm talking about right here. Are you grateful for the bed that your parents have worked hard to provide for you? I got a text from one of our young men the other day, and I cherish that text. He's helped me on the ranch through the years. He's got a real job now where he actually gets paid. But he sent me a text. And he said, Pastor, I wanted to thank you for teaching me how to work. And you know that blessed my heart? I'm serious. It blessed my heart. So I want to ask you kids, are you grateful that your parents have provided you an education? Are you grateful that they provided you food to eat, transportation? We live in a thankless society. Give me more, give me more, give me more. Let's all stand. A long time ago, I learned the words of a little chorus. And it said, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and so free. Are you thankful today? If you'll bow your head and close your eyes, no one's looking around. Miss Kristen's going to play. I see some coming to the altar right now. Listen, if you've not been thankful, you can ask God's forgiveness right where you sit. Or you can walk down this aisle and bow your knee at this altar and say, God, you've been so, so good to me. God, you've opened the windows of heaven and poured out a blessing so great that I could never, I could never name them all. Some are coming to the altars. What about you? Are you grateful? Are you thankful? Thankful to God. I think it'd be a great thing if maybe some of you young people might be willing to look to your mom and dad and say, Mom, Dad, I'm grateful to God for you. I'm grateful to God that you've loved me and provided for me. You know, I've been working and preparing this message for a couple of weeks. And every time I sit down, I'm reminded of how ungrateful I am in certain areas of my life. It should never be so. It should never be so. If you're not saved today, would you be willing to walk down this aisle and give your life to Jesus? Would you do that? Whatever, whatever decision you need to make this morning, 
Would you do that? She's going to play one more verse. If you don't come, you're going to close the service. Would you come? Preacher, I need to get saved today. Walk down this aisle. I'll meet you right here. We have people that will pray with you. If you need to come, you come. Would you do that? Maybe somebody's at the altar that you need to pray with. Would you do that? I surrender all.